Well, let's uh, let's introduce our guests then. We're going to have a discussion. We're going to have a question and answer session later. Would you please welcome Mr. Malcolm Bricklin? Also with us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome John Tucker. I would like to acknowledge the uh, spouses of these two gentlemen. Sunia Bricklin is with us. Sunia, there she is. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, also Thelma Tucker. Thelma was with us this morning. We, we looked at a few cars and fire trucks, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, with me tonight as well, my wife, Patricia Reed Crichton. Pat is over with the ladies. Now, what qualifies me to do this? Okay, I have an orphan car. I have a, a 1976 American Motors Pacer. <laughs> Pacer. And I believe this is a car that's growing in value. It's the second one I had. I had a brand new one back in the day. Then my daughter came along, and it's uh, we've all got this story as it was leaving the driveway, and it was the mistake of my life. Never thought I'd find another one until a friend said, are you looking for a Pacer? You know, right out of the blue, I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, there's one on Kijiji, and if you don't buy it, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> and it was almost the same as the one I had it. A three on the floor. I was looking for a stick, 258, straight inch, a straight six, uh, with a three on the floor. Uh, I'm not terribly handy. I'm lucky that I can find people to work on my car. Now, Mr. Bricklin may have recalled seeing it a couple of years ago when he was in Chatham for the Retrofest cruise. And uh, I, I found it fascinating when we were looking, and I hope you'll uh, bear with me, gentlemen, as I digress all over the place here. I'm, I'm pretty good at rambling, so cut me off if, if you, uh, you want to. But I was looking under the hood of the, the uh, Bricklin. Now, this was uh, in Brent's collection. This was uh, 75 Bricklin. This was one of the early models with an American Motors engine in it. And I'm an American Motors guy, so I was thrilled to see the 360 in there and a manual transmission. Also under the hood, an air conditioning unit, which is identical to the one on my Pacer, a brake unit, uh, and master cylinder, identical to the one on my Pacer. These cars are of a period. Uh, and some of the livery and the stuff under the hood, even though we're talking an exotic car here and a more mundane car like I have, some of the stuff is the same. And I find it fascinating, too. Of course, you know as well as I do, you can research almost anything on the web, and there's all kinds of... Um, uh, videos, but I think one of the charming things about the uh, the Bricklin is a lot of the stuff was good old North American stuff. You can probably find brakes for it. You can probably put Ford parts on it or General Motors parts and be on the, uh, the road with it. Now, we're talking also a very rare and exotic car, and of course this came first when we talk about the Tucker. And, uh, John, I'm hoping we can talk tonight. Most of us will have seen the movie The Tucker. My wife and I uh, watched bits of it over breakfast again this morning as I prepared for this. And it's a movie that we like to watch at least once a year, uh, often before a car show or car show season. And uh, maybe at some point we can talk about just how accurate this is in portraying the uh, story of the Tucker. And I hope that they did consult with the family. But I want to say to both of you gentlemen, you are with friends and you have come to the right place. We agree on that. Thank you. <laughs> now, since, since uh, my arrival, and I'm going to wrap it up and then we're going to begin the discussion very shortly, I got here about 20 years ago. I grew up on Lake Erie, but the uh, North Shore Lake Erie, but the East End. I'm from Port Colborne near Buffalo originally, though I think I've died and gone to heaven since I've moved to Windsor and Chatham. Uh, I'm a gearhead, and I recognize that I'm probably as close to heaven as I'm going to get. I say with the deepest of respect, and I think of people like Stan Ewer, we have more quality tool and die craftsmen, engine builders, fabricators, body and paint men and women in concentration than probably any place else. If it can't be made or repaired here, it can't be done. Of course it can't be done. So with that, I welcome you to our forum and let's get our chat away. I'm going to try not to be obtrusive, but just to guide the conversation, if you will, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna get our hands dirty figuratively. So again, please welcome our guests, John and Malcolm. Happy to be here. Absolutely. Thank you also once again to the spouses who, who put up with this and sometimes travel great distances to support us. Their whole life. Their whole life, yes. <laughs> and
and my wife indulges me too. You know, even if it's just driving me to a car show so that I can concentrate on what I'm going to do, I'm deeply grateful for that. Well, I would like to, I would like to ask the question, why this car? What vision led to it? And perhaps we can start that uh, with Malcolm, and then I'll ask John the same thing. Malcolm, why this car? What was the vision? What was at the time I was chairman of Subaru of America, and they were talking about um, the safety. They wanted to start building cars that were safer. And the people who did not want to be able to end up with the regulations would argue that if you built a safe car, it was going to be ugly. All the stuff you're going to put on it is going to just make the car ugly. And I went, what are they talking about? How, what are they, why would they say some stupid things like that? I'm going to build a safety car that's going to be more beautiful than anything. And believe it or not, that was my motive for building the car. John. Well, um, basically, it's sort of the same story. Preston was in the in the Indianapolis racing business, and uh, he met uh, his, his mentor, Harry Miller, who was the most successful race car builder of all time, I would say. And uh, they, they got together, and the same thing. They sort of wanted to put all those ideas into a car that, you know, an Indy car has to be very safe to go 200 miles an hour. At that time, it was about 140. But um, he said, we were going to build the safest car on the road. And then they both agreed on that, and... And uh, of course, they proved that it couldn't be. That it could be beautiful. It wasn't going to be an ugly car. So, um, but then from then on, they just kept plugging away and, and uh, you kept moving forward. It just, I've, I've sort of seen this this weekend with with it, with Malcolm that once an entrepreneur gets going, you can't stop it. You're just going to go and go and go. And it's, it's, any any problem we bring up this weekend, Malcolm goes, "Well, here, let's just do this. We can do this." And that's, that's sort of what I think Preston, his motivation always was. Well, first of all, spending time with John and his family this weekend was really wonderful because the Tucker was one of my inspirations for a safety car. I wanted to copy as much as I could of the things he did. Of course, I saw the movie too, and it really pissed me off. It pissed me off that <laughs> the powers that be seem to always mess you up because for some reason there's this jealousy of people who don't want things to happen. I mean, like even where we're sitting right now, I've heard and understand that it's taken forever to get this as a place where you can come and eat and drink without a lot of aggravation and a lot of rules and regulations that keep you from getting there. It really pisses me off. It pisses me off about that as much as it does about the people who wanted to keep the tucker from happening and the people, well, I don't know if there was a lot of people who wanted to keep our car from happening, but it was a political situation that ended up killing it. And it just, why does that have to happen? Why can't people just encourage, for instance, make this into something really great? I know that uh, Brent has spent money and time to create something here that would be good for the town, yet the town goes out of its way to not do nice things to him, to make it tough for him to do it, spend more money and keep it from happening instead of being behind him. And to tell you the truth, now that I'm older and can say anything I want to say. <laughs> because once I reach Sadie, everything changed. Everybody wants to open the door for you and all the see, but they're worried you're going to fall down and kill yourself or something. But you're allowed to say what you want to say, and nobody, well, they may object, but they don't push it too hard. They figure, what the hell, I'll be dead soon anyhow. <laughs> By the way, Brendan, his family, his family, Reg and his whole family, they're the most quality people I think I've ever met. They do, uh, they're just forward movers and do beautiful things, including my new ring. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you know, I, beautiful, by the way. You ought to uh, check it out. I can't say enough about Brandy. He and Corey are wonderful. They did wonderful things. And she, <laughs> and she, makes great, she makes great nachos. <laughs> I saw that in my briefing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, John and I talked about today, about we've been here in less than 48 hours, and we feel like well, everybody in this town is our friend and it's have true. been there forever. Very true. It is the most wonderful feeling I have ever had, and it makes me really lucky, feel lucky, that I'm here with you guys. Can I tell you a funny story? I, I, I don't think I'm betraying a secret, because I, I got to know Malcolm over the course of the day. I was wearing a, a fedora that I got from Boys and Herd. And it's, it's, I think it's an Italian hat, and it looks a little bit. I put a pair of Ray-Bans on, I put this hat on. If I carried a guitar case, it would look like there was going to be a hit. <laughs> 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 exactly. Yeah. Malcolm saw me come through uh, the door at Retro Suites and said, where do I get a hat like that? So 
Later, uh, Brent and his dad took us out to the satellite restaurant for a bite to eat, and boys and horse Curtis right next door. So I said, well, let's pop in. And uh, Eddie, we learned, is a uh, terrific gentleman, and he's contemplating retirement properly because I believe in, the, in his late 80s. He said, there's no more hats. I'm not ordering anymore. We're trying to gently liquidate things. But any, So anyway, Malcolm wanted to buy something. So we went and bought a jacket right off the rack, and he just put it on, and it was gold. And then he got, yeah, let's, let's, yeah, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> that happened around 2 o'clock this afternoon, and he got two pair of tailored pants. And he got pants. pants, and the guy, when I went to pick him up, oh, he, he, altered, he altered it in, what, an hour? And then when I went to go, he gave me these socks. <laughs> <laughs> John, any any uh, first impressions as far as you're concerned? I know you're not from as far afield here, so no, I'm not from Ann Arbor, Michigan. My wife and I are, in, uh, but we've been coming here for years because her family has roots here in in, in, uh, in, or in, in Ontario. So uh, I've I've loved this town since uh, probably 30 years. I think that, that uh, we've been coming here. But and when I met Brett, um, actually Brett called me. We were only friends through Facebook and a little bit of other things. And one day he called me and said. I'm going to see a Tucker today at RM. Would you like to go? And I had no idea which one it was, or but uh, we I came into town and we we uh, spent the day with R and M. And I actually got to drive my. Turned out it was number 29, which was my grandfather's personal car. Oh wow! So, so wow. I got to drive that car, see that car for the first time, number one, and drive that car at RM for the first time ever, of course. But what a, what an experience for me! So we were instant friends, and from then on. John, we know when uh, when God gave out the gifts, they were they were shared so that very few of us possess all the fine qualities. We uh, may have one fine quality or two, and then mm -hmm. the people next to us have the rest. So when we're talking about uh, car pioneers, I would presume that no one of those people would have it all. So Preston Tucker is was a visionary. Uh, obviously, was a great salesperson. Obviously, was passionate about cars. Right. How far can that take you? And uh, again, I want to emphasize that there's many fine cars that are. God, I think about. I get almost emotional when I think about something like Studebaker, for example, which I believe was the only car that made it from the check wagon days right. to the kind motorized of days. Kind of wagon, yeah. kind of, and it survives up into the 60s, then it's gone. <clears throat> you look at Packard, what a great motor car company. <laughs> Didn't quite make it to its 60th birthday. Nobody would say that these weren't good cars or worthy cars. So. Let's get over that right away. And no disrespect to the big three. We've all owned them and driven them, and they're great cars. They're still with us today. But just because a car is no longer with us doesn't mean it wasn't worthy. And that's certainly true of the Brooklyn and the Tucker. So how, how do you reconcile this? The creative uh, sensibility uh, brought into to clash with the political world and the realities of... Uh, well, I think the first thing I think of with Preston is my grandfather. Um, I always call him Preston. Um, he's fearless. He was fearless. Nothing would stop him. You could tell him no. You told him no, he'd go to somebody else and get a yes, get it done. And that's that carried him through his whole life, and it, it, even up to the end when he uh, it, the company went, you know, he lost the company and it was all totally gone, and, and the government was against him. They acquitted him, but he was out of business. So um, he he regrouped in uh, about 1951 or two, after everything was liquidated and gone. He went to Brazil. Because they asked him, he knew some. He knew the president of Brazil, and he had asked him to come down and help them figure out how to industrialize the country. And uh, he came up with a, a, a whole plan of new cars and things that he was going to build in Brazil. Uh, the first one was going to be a, a kit type car, and um, it would uh, would be built there, and you bring it back here and have a guy or it'd be assembled there, or no, not assembled, but built all the pieces. He'd send it over here, and, and somebody would assemble it in a shop in the United States. And he'd already set up a dealer's network of 5,000 dealers, so they were all they were all taken to go. So um, but that's he, he never gave up. And he died in 1956. But, uh, he died working on that car. And now, what 70 years later, my sons are building that car. Oh. Now you're, we're contemporaries, so you would have lived long enough to. You would have been a very young boy, but you would have met Preston. You would have known oh, your yeah. grandpa. Well, I was born at, at 110 North Park Street. Um, I sat on his lap. I slept in the. They always would say, if you're looking for Johnny, go look in the back of the, the one car they had left. And, and I'd be sleeping on it, so, which I was often. But, but 
Yeah, so I, I, I you know, you, you catch the spirit of, of something, too. How, how about the, your answer to that, Malcolm? Just the, the creative uh, sensibility that comes in conflict, if you will, with the larger powers. Well, from my point of view, I have always somehow been drawn to creating my own thing, whatever it is that I want to do. But creating a business, a car is a business. And the part of, oh, I want to, I like that color and I like that design and let's engineer it this way. That, to some people, are very difficult, but it's easy when you get good people to do it. And so that you, your dream moves on. And then you, you have to go to the next part, which is running the business. All different game. Not the part I like. And it's the part that if you don't do it, you got a problem. You don't have a business. So there you got to hire different kind of people. They aren't the same, and it's, they don't have the same love. And that's the part that really hurts. But over the years, I've learned how to pass that point, how to have people that I trust that have the same feeling about what they're doing, but want to run, want to run the business, and I've associated with them. And instead of them being employees, they are stockholders. So I'm not a boss any longer. I'm just a partner. And boy, oh boy, is that life different. Having people to depend to run the business part makes really life, you know, as an entrepreneur, 10,000 times easier to do, much more fun to do, and it's going to end up being more successful. <coughs> but one of the things that I have learned over and over, and I don't know why it takes so damn long for me to learn certain things, <laughs> to stay away from the government. Stay away from getting money from the government. And that's death. Because they go into, and then they're doing it for political reasons, and if it doesn't move fast enough, it's no good. And if the political party on the other side sees it's going well, which is good for whoever it is that gave the money, then they are down on the business. You create too many enemies that shouldn't be. So from my point of view, my biggest lesson I learned when it came to raising money is stay away from the government. No matter what they offer you, it's going to turn out not good in my my opinion. And every time I've done it, I wish I did. Now, how about your experience with the New Brunswick government? I lived in the Maritimes for 20 years. I was in Nova Scotia, but I knew New Brunswick fairly well as well. And uh, I was down there in the 80s and the 90s, but the 70s were a particularly difficult time. I know in, in Sydney, Cape Breton, I mean, you had uh, you had a coal mine and a steel mill. And my dad worked for Algoma Steel, though, in Ontario. He was a steel man from Scotland originally. But I remember my dad saying to me, the moment the government gets involved in, in this, you know it's it's no longer viable. Private industry probably would have left, but but people needed jobs. So Absolutely. people in New Brunswick needed jobs. It sounded like a very noble. Uh, I mean, you when you arrived for a time anyway, you were probably the answer man. Well, first of all, the premier, Premier Hatfield, I have the great. I he's not alive anymore. I have the greatest respect for. Him. I enjoyed him. Enjoyed talking to him. I enjoyed what his vision for the province was. To me, he was one of the closest to a perfect politician that you could find. Intelligent and caring and wanting to do really good for the province. He really did come from there, from the beginning to the end. He was a populist. Uh... He was a populist, but he really, if there was a politician I've ever met in my life, he was the best. Now, he saw that what this car would do for the province is get attention that it was not a whole bunch of people just doing logging and fishing. And that's what his goal was, to get publicity, to see that they had other things and attract other kinds of companies. That is, was his goal. And I included him on interviews everywhere in the world. When we went to Harvard for business school to talk to them, he was there with me. When we went on interviews with major NBC or CBS, I called him. He was there to talk about his province, to get the benefit of what this would do. That was part of the deal, which I lovingly was willing to do my part of. Then something happened that I found amazingly interesting. He came to me one day and said, I'm calling an election. Right? He said, I want three birth hunts. You got them. What do you want it for? He said, one, is a car going to go forward and get a crowd? The second Brooklyn is going to go with my mother in it. And the third Brooklyn is going to be me. And that will draw attention. And actually, the, that's what I invested in. Here's what it is. You have 1,200 great paying jobs. They're doing great. People love the car. Give it a chance to mature. That was his message. Well, he won the election. He won by the biggest landslide in New Brunswick ever. And if you saw the papers of the day after the election, you saw a Brooklyn car 
and him coming out of the top of it with a Superman uniform on. <laughs> and it was called the Brooklyn Election. Not Malcolm Brooklyn, the car. I thought, well, look at that. <laughs> I'm going to get anything I want. Wrong. <laughs> Two months after that, this premier, who, by the way, truly loved what was happening and truly wanted to back it in every way, shape, or form, came to New, New Brunswick. I had phone in for whatever. And he said, uh, Malcolm, I'm going to close you down. Now, that was not normally his sense of humor. But it's sort of shocking, since things were going pretty damn good. We had a back order of 45,000 cars. Everybody says, oh, they didn't sell the car. We had plenty of back orders. What we needed to do is fix up the car. It came off. There were imperfections. We were fixing. That's what happens with cars. You fix them. That's what it takes time to must spent twenty billion dollars, twenty billion dollars fixing his car, <laughs> but and he said Elon, Elon Musk, and, yeah. and he was smart enough to find a way to get a lot of money. That was to me the biggest thing he's done so far. He built a great car. All those things are true, but he came in and said, "I'm closing it down," and I said, "Excuse me, why would you be doing that?" And he said, "I made a mistake." He said, "I used the cars to win the election. I used the Brooklyn and what we have accomplished here to win the election, and I did." And now, every single day of my life, when the reporters are here to talk to me, they want to talk about two things. How's Malcolm? And how's the car? And there was nothing else they wanted to talk to. He said, I cannot run this province that way. So I am betting if I close this down a year from now, it'll be forgotten, and I'll call another election. And he did, and he did, and he won again. So from his point of view, it was a good move. He was not. He was no longer valid politically in any conversation, and this changed that game. From uh, 1,200 people, and you got rid of them. I lost a lot of money. The car didn't have a chance to perfect itself. God bless. That's dealing business with the government, Malcolm, and that's the lesson. That time I learned it. After that, because that was the most impossible thing I could possibly imagine. I mean, we really liked each other. He really liked this project. He did something for his survival that made sense to him politically and in turn killed the very thing that he wanted to create. Now, as a side event, <laughs> a little bit later, the Queen came, someplace landed, and he was, went on the plane, he was invited, but when they searched him, they found pot in his pocket and they kicked him off the plane. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> that was before they had to make it be legal. <laughs> I had forgotten that. That's true. John, uh, when you think of uh... Of the Tucker, it fit a more classically American model where entrepreneur goes for broke, doesn't, uh, uh, I don't know if it would have been available in those days anyway, but didn't ask anything of the government other than not to mire the company in red tape. Um, well, that, that really, well, that's not true. No. Okay. Um, no. The, <laughs> he, they gave him the biggest plant in the world, which was the Dodge Bomber plant, which made them his partner. Okay. So, so he was in the bed with the government right from the start, and they had weekly meetings where they you have to give them weekly reports of what was going on and justify everything. So they were they were in the plant the whole time, and I think some of that is why he failed. He, he had to, he could have gotten a smaller plant or a, you know, less finance plant, but um, but he could have done it without the government. No, but at that point, but uh, he uh, he had he had to play ball with them, and that uh, that slowed him down and ended up destroying. Now, in the movie, uh, which I presume most people have seen, it's certainly readily accessible. You might even be able to get it from the library. Uh, we have the Lloyd Bridges character who is uh, uh, ostensibly representing the big three that really right. wanted to put uh, Tucker out of business. How much right. of that is true? I mean, liberties are taken, but... Well, he represented Homer Ferguson, who was a, a senator from Detroit and uh, married to a Dodge, so he had a big stake in it. So he didn't... Uh, he actually... Preston actually originally wanted the Willow Run plant in, in his plant because it was right in his backyard, but... Um, Henry or Kaiser, um, or Joe, yeah, Kaiser um, was sort of shooing for that because he had all the money and all the fame and had done all the steel and the, the aluminum. But uh, but he couldn't get that one, um, so he went to Chicago, which happened to be a even bigger plant, which was kind of his downfall. But uh, he had lots of ideas to keep that going, but they all had to be car related, so he couldn't uh, lease out parts of the plant for other things. So that just was kind of destroyed. Well, was he was he given a fair shake? No, <laughs> no. They they uh, they kind of they they uh, they gave him trouble from the start, and uh, he was 
couldn't get steel, you couldn't get you know, uh, materials. And uh, finally, actually, there was the true part of that you know, the movie was that uh, Howard Hughes did have a conversation with him, not in purpose. He didn't go out and see the spruce goose and see him in a dark alley. But, um, <laughs> but he did. He did call him on the phone, um, and talk to him, and said uh, suggested that there was a plant in Syracuse, New York. It used to be the Franklin Motor Car Company that was now called Airfield Motors, and they had a really um, they had a plenty of steel, and they had a really nice horizontally opposed engine that really probably work in the car. So he flew his trashy Conestoga plane right to, right to Syracuse and uh, landed. And uh, the story goes that he, he came down on the floor and, and they've they got engines going down on the assembly line. And he said, I'd like those next 50 engines to go to Ypsilanti, Michigan, so I can modify them. And of course, the supervisor said, well, these are going to Bell Helicopter. So he went up. And uh, at that time, he had, he had lots of money in his pocket. So he went up to the to the offices and bought the company for $1.3 million. And then he came back down and said, now can I have those next 50 <laughs> 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 so, so that, 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 that kind of thing, was that was the only viable part of it at the end. But, uh, pretty much from then, they just kept, you know, then they, they finally at one point just came and seized all his records and he was dead in the water. So. Can you, uh, in the movie, uh, if he had a deadline. He had to have 50 cars built by a certain time. Right. Was that true? That was true. In order to keep the plant, he had. Uh, um, I think it was, what kind of thing? What kind of? Well, what it was just to prove that he was trying to build oh, a car, okay. really, basically. And uh, and they started but building. They started building cars. Well, they didn't. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> they uh, they got about thirty six of them done, completely, and then uh, that's when they shut them down. So of course. So they didn't want them. Because they didn't. He did well. They they, right, pretty much. I mean, no matter how you but, it, they but didn't his want employees them. stayed on, and in, in the next few months they built those last cars. Yeah. And uh, they, you know, we actually had letters from Dan LeBeau, who was his, his closest employee, that would say, well, we got 44 done today, and we got 45 done today, and, and then they got every all 50 of them done. So uh, that was, uh, that, that's how they were. Well, those are the so days, they, did, they did build 50 cars. Well, those are the days where the auto manufacturers had a lot of pull. Mm -hmm. Whatever they did, you could get away with, they would get away with. Sure, oh yeah. And, yeah. and Henry Ford is the one guy that I don't, that doesn't get a good shape with Preston because he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't against it. Preston, Preston had worked for him at the Rouge when he was a kid and uh, when they needed, uh, somebody visited the plant at some point in the manufacturing, they couldn't get the steering wheel. So Ford called back to, to, uh, to Dearborn and said, well, we've got a whole bin of, of uh, seconds reject for a, for a Lincoln Continental. If you'd like those, you can have those and then you can just give them back when you get your own. So he, he cut part of the Part of the horn rim off, and uh, those came right from Ford. It's just for free. You know? Wow! You need a steering wheel, and we'll, we'll get it. Now, I think it's testament to the car, uh, which, as we know, is very valuable. But perhaps even thirty years as recently as thirty years ago, wasn't seen as particularly valuable. But so many of them have survived. Well, in, up until about nineteen eighty-eight, they were going up slowly. They got to about sixty thousand dollars. Um, my best story that I told Malcolm earlier, um, Tom Monahan, the owner of Domino's Pizza, uh, was building a big car collection. So he bought a, he bought one in 1986 for sixty-six million dollars or sixty-six uh, sixty-six thousand dollars. And uh, but a year after the movie, in 1989, he sold that car for three hundred thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> so that's when they started to really catapult. And you know, after the movie, he was you know, perceived more as a hero. Before then, it was about fifty-fifty. Most a lot of people didn't like him because a lot of people had lost money or their family had lost. So uh, after that, then, then they just started to shoot down. The market has taken to about the, the best one on the planet, which happens to be the one my son did. <laughs> uh, is it worth about $3 million? John, tell wow. us, tell us yeah. about the Tucker connection to this So wait a second. So that means the Tucker really built the car in Yeah, Yep, my son's. It's actually a factory rebuild. That's the way I look at it. <laughs> That's great. I was going to say, tell us about the Tucker connection to this day. While I, I understand you don't have a Tucker in your personal no. Uh, possession. Your your sons are really keeping the legacy alive. Yeah, they they uh, they manufacture parts for Tuckers. They uh, they build tuck Tuckers. They build some out of fiberglass. It's all done with the Ida family in Morganville, New Jersey. Uh, Rob Ida's grandfather was a Tucker dealer back in '47, so he's always loved the car. And then his son Bob, Rob's father, decided he was going to build his father a Tucker. So they built. They were they were car builders anyway. So they got the molds from the the Lucasfilm. 
they built they built him a fiberglass bucket. And then they ended up building four of those, and the boys helped them, and they've been buddies ever since, and they've been building cars. So when this lady, this owner, bought his car and he needed a total restoration, he, he asked them if they'd do it. And the sons will do. The sons are kind of all or nothing, so they said if you'll give us, we'll do the whole job. Drop it off here, and we'll bring it back a turnkey car. And he did. So, um, it was a lot of money. It's likely to say how much, but it was a lot of money. But they, uh, um, they took that car to Pebble Beach in 2018, and uh, um, it was up against another another local car, one that, that RM did for George Lucas. And uh, George Lucas took first place, and we took second place. So we're happy about that. Malcolm, your uh, your car uh, utilized the latest materials available at that time, and I love the uh, fact that the color was impregnated in the body of the brick. Well, it was actually even different than that. And it wasn't a technology that was a, a, a future technology to be used by the auto companies. Nobody ever used it before, and nobody ever used it after. And what I was, what, my first problem was a paint facility cost $300 million. I was trying to do all these things for under $50 million. And I was succeeding, by the way. And one of the things I did to get rid of the need for the $300 million is went out and found a sheet of acrylic, solid paint. It came from Roman Haas. And the colors on the car were not ones I picked. They were the only ones I could get. So those five <laughs> colors are the colors of the car. And I named them safety, red, and safety. That's my contribution to the color. Then, I mean, that was too weak. You could not put that on a car. And then we reinforced it with fiberglass. So it was not a fiberglass car. It was an acrylic fiberglass car. What's the difference? If you have an acrylic, car, if a fiberglass car like a Corvette, and you hit it, it runs. It smashes. And you, it just runs. The whole thing runs. And you sort of ruin the fender or whatever it is you hit. When you take the acrylic and put it in fiberglass and you hit it, you can't make it dent. And it doesn't go run anywhere. If you can hit it hard enough, it'll make a hole. And that hole can be put right back, and a posse on the back, and buffed on the top, and it's just like a brand new car. And at 30 miles an hour, because that's a crash test we had to do, we they figured exactly where it was going to break, and it broke exactly at the same place on the fender, and they put the fender back together. So even in the 30 mile an hour crash, although it smashed a whole bunch of stuff in the inside and the engines and all those other things, but the body itself, and I said back then, those bodies are going to look just as good 40 years from today as it. And There's one outside that's 45 years old, and it looks just as good as it did when it came out. The and back. it's been crash tested too. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm, what, what do you see in cars today that you're proud to say was influenced by you that was part of the Brickland uh, legacy? Or have we thrown away all the good ideas? Well, you know, I was doing something different than what you do if you're in the big car business. For instance, at the time when we were building the car, safety was a big deal in conversation. The government was trying to make the rules even stiffer. And of course, the big three, when I say the big three, I'm talking about all the auto manufacturers. We're not happy about making rules that made it more costly and more difficult. And one of the rules they were trying to get was a five mile an hour bumper that would not cost money by hitting it at five miles an hour. So it's a five mile an hour crash in most average cars cost a thousand dollars. In more expensive cars, it's more expensive. Especially true today. Right. I have a 10 mile, I, the Brickman had a 10 mile an hour bumper. How did we get that 10 mile an hour bumper? Because I really wanted, that was one of my criteria, I wanted to build a car. So you can have safe and not spend money when you had minor accidents. One day I was flying in LA and the plane landed. I went, wow, that plane just went like this. So I went to the people who make the landing gear. And I said, here's my problem, what do I do? And they asked me, said, no problem, the problem solved. And they made me two, hydro not hydraulics, but... Uh, <laughs> things that went in and out. Forget what they were thought. It was basically air. And I had two in the front, two in the back, and the bumpers themselves were very solid in there. And they, they compressed when they got hit, but they came out. And you would hit the car at 10 mile an hour, and instead of it being part of the front, 
all the front was around the bumper itself. So the bumper could go in without touching the body at all and come back out and it worked. And so all the little accidents didn't have it. Now, a little fast forward. The government was having this, I want to have a five mile an hour bumper. So they hold hearings and they invited me to these hearings. And I would say- What year was this, can you recall? Uh, yeah, it was 1973, 1973 to 1974. And they would say to me, um, and I say to me, they would say to the people who were sitting there with their lawyers, General Motors and Ford and, and Mercedes and you name it, they were there. And the lawyers were the ones who made the answers to everything that was asked from the executives. But basically they were there to try to protect that thousand dollars that they were making and the dealer was making. It was business for both of them. They did not want to throw that away. I'm the big number. And they would say all the reasons why they couldn't do it, and they got to me, and I said, well, we have 10 mile an hour bumpers, which is not double five, it's four times five to get that physically, and we have a couple cars downstairs if you want to see them. And I brought the little thing with me, and I told them exactly the same story, and put it on the desk. <laughs> see, and it wasn't the cost of making them that they were talking about, really. It was the things they were losing when you smashed that car at five miles an hour. The answer was, they didn't get five mile an hour. It didn't pass. What a surprise. John, how about the, the uh, Tucker Legacy, a car that has so many revolutionary features? Do you see anything today that makes you smile? It was on your grandfather's car. Well, the first thing that made me smile early in, in the early 60s was when the new Corvettes came out in 1963, and they had the doors that opened into the roof. It was exactly the same profile as the Tucker, and uh, I thought that was a nice little bit. Um, most cars have disc brakes. We had disc brakes in 1947. Um, most of the cars didn't get fitted with them later, but um, it was a kid mount brake system, which was a beautiful system. Most hot rods use them today. And a padded dash is another one. That, that, uh, um, you had the first padded dash, and now every car's got that in there also. And airbags, which we never even thought of. Right? But uh, the, the one thing that uh, most people don't realize is that the frame was actually built in the front as a V. So unless you hit that car dead on, you'd either tear this this bump this fender off or this fender off. So you'd flinch off one way or the other. And that was that actually worked for you guys. Um, so that was one of his that you never saw it. You never, they never saw it. They just thought the Tucker was that way because of the center headlights, but it was really because of those fenders they just peel right off. How about the famous safety well that we hear about? <laughs> yeah. I think that was shown in the Tucker instructional films, yeah. wasn't it? If you were gonna get in a crash and you knew it, um, there was a, what they called a crash compartment, which was a, basically a little bunker. Um, you know, they, only had, they had a very small um, dashboard just behind the steering wheel. It was only about this big, and then the dash, the steering wheel was right in front of it. But on the other side, it was totally open. And uh, you could, um, theoretically, I think it was really naive, but theoretically, you could just dive down into that crash compartment. And it was safe. It was fully sealed up. And you, would, you wouldn't get hurt. But uh, this, it, it, he demonstrated he used to hire uh, gymnasts, <laughs> gymnasts to, to ride around with the cars, and they jumped down in. Of course, they could jump down in a few seconds, and, and uh, no problem at all. But uh, that was another another idea that was, that was a, a good one. But then, by the way, the dashboard, um, like I said, only about this big, and it's sort of surround with a with a center uh, steer uh, speedometer and four gauges right in the speedometer, which which actually he uh, took from. We saw a bunch of them. That's actually from a CPRA fire truck. I looked at about 10 of them yesterday. And, uh, all you have to do is take the, the faceplate off of the CPRA, put the Tucker faceplate on, that's exactly the same thing. We've, we've talked, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about uh, often the role of uh, a meddling government in, in uh, snuffing out a good idea. But we also recognize as car people that sometimes um, you've got a good idea, but it's just a little bit too early for it. And the public uh, decides that. Uh, the Chrysler Airflow, for example, which it's not necessarily a handsome vehicle, but uh, I remember seeing one at the Chrysler Museum, and I thought, man, this is really something else. But it was, and it was very safe, too, but it was way ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. But this was not the case with the Tucker. Uh, though we're talking a fairly finite number of vehicles that were made, there was plenty of interest in them. It wasn't too oh, yeah. no, he, had, he had hundreds of thousands of orders and, and took hundreds of thousands of orders, which uh, you know, all they would get was their radio in order their, their uh, they, they famously could get the radio, they could get the seat covers, um, the heaters. Um, little accessories, which you could use on any car, so, but that was one of the things they, they came after in the box, <coughs> selling parts to cars that didn't exist, as Lloyd Richard put it, yeah. but, uh, but that, uh, that was one of his ways of raising. 
and he raised about thirteen million dollars doing it. There's there's thirty five pepper radios out there. That's great, and that's bad that's money great. back in the day. Now, yeah. Malcolm, also you there's slightly fewer than three thousand uh, Brooklyn's made, but you said there was plenty of orders for the car. It was not too back not too revolutionary for the for the public. The public. Oh no no, let me tell you something. There's something about doors that are very attractive for cars. Those gold wing doors were the Brooklyn. Without them, it would have been a normal car. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the wing doors has a problem. One of the problems it has, we solved, and it's never been done before on any, before or after, and the our going door had a window that went up and down. Uh, in the door end, they had a little window that slid, yes. because the physics of it being out there and being back here are immense. But if you have the hydraulics, it's not a problem. But then there's another kind of problem. When you have a gold wing door, no matter what you want, when it's raining, it's going to rain in. And people think the door leaked. The door never leaked. There were plenty of uh, places that we had to make sure it didn't leak. But when the car is up, it rains in. And when you're waiting for hydraulic to... Oh, that's another oh, great story. <laughs> the cars are coming off the line. I love my car. I would have the doors up and sit in the driveway and look at it. And one day it's raining. So I run out to get in the car and I push the button. And with that hydraulic, it takes six seconds to open. One, two, I'm in the rain. Three, four, five, I'm in the rain. Six, I jump in. It takes six seconds to shut. One, two, oh my God. This is not okay. This is just not. And if I make it go faster, it's going to cut your hands off. Somebody's going to cut their hands off. Ah, oh, what am I going to do? Well, I have an inventor friend that lived in Graham, Texas, and he, in fact, invented an engine that was beyond revolutionary, and he asked me to put my name on it and put money into it to see if we'd get publicity. We had him on uh, for the uh, dinos. We had everything ready to go. Mechanics Illustrated came and put it on the front cover and simply said, it's unbelievable. We saw it all work. So now I'm trying to, what am I going to do? I cannot have the cars this way. It is not okay. I now hate my car. I'm never going to ride it in the rain. I'm not standing 12 seconds in the car. So I call him up, and he flies in from Grand, and he says, okay, give me the keys. Gave him a key to one of the car, and he drives back. A week later, he calls me. He said, I'm back. I'm coming back. It's solved. What did he do? He took out the hydraulic and put air in it. And you push the button, it goes, whoop. And when you push the button to go down, it goes, whoop, and stops six inches from the top and then closes. Nobody, to my knowledge, has had their hand hurt with doing that, and it solved the problem. The problem was we ended up going out of business before we could put it in the car, and the people that ended up going into business fixing Brickland's put it in most of the cars out there. So most of the cars have that. But we never got it on the line. This is the refinement you were talking about. Those are the things you... we were working on that in normal case, you have the money to get there. We did. But it wouldn't have mattered because he didn't close it because of that problem. He closed it because of the political problem. No matter how good it was, people were not going to talk about anything he had to say except he won the goddamn election. <laughs> talk about the dark and talk about Malcolm. Let's say the Brooklyn was still with us today. I, I, I've been attracted to unusual cars having a, I've got a PT Cruiser, uh, which I like, but there was only so much they could do with that. Uh, you think about the Mini, uh, other than making it grotesquely large, it's certainly not like the original Mini. My Pacer, uh, they built it for five years at the end of it. They made a wagon, but apart from that, there wasn't much they could do with it. What would the uh, Brooklyn be like if it was with us today? Well, it would be different for starters, or it would have been out of business. Because there's one thing about, no matter how much you like a thing, when there's too many of those things, it loses its appeal. So you're, one of the things about the car business, no matter how great it is, you've got to keep on making changes in that car. Those are lessons I learned. So what I'm about to do, which is building another car, but this time electric, I'm changing the exterior styling of the car, fitting on the same frame every 25,000 vehicles, which will be once a month. Because the volume on that will be three hundred thousand. So you're telling us you're building, you're working on something new. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can't sit still. That's for darn sure. <laughs> <laughs>
hold that thought. I want to get back to that. Can I ask John? <laughs> no. I just want to finish asking John the same question. If the uh, Tucker was with us today, how would that car have, have changed? Uh, I would imagine um, just just knowing what the technology is doing in North Crescent, it wouldn't be a gas. It wouldn't be a gas engine. It'd be an electric car. It would be. Uh, it would have. It would have all the latest things. You know, um, for the electric, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to forecast something like that. But I just sort of look at what my sons are doing, and they're always building a new car, and everything's electric. I mean, he just he just bought his wife a Bolt, which which is a good, pretty good car for what it is. It's a hybrid. It's somewhere along somewhere in the middle range. Um, she actually hasn't. She works in Lehigh University, she's five miles from work. She takes that car to and from work. She's never used any gas. Ever. It's all electric. So <coughs> you know, when they go on a trip, then they, they, they get like gas kicked in. But, but that's that's. I'm, the, uh, he was never. He was always moving forward. And uh, that's what I think. Who knows where he would have taken it? He sort of take over the market. With, with it. Let's so, talk about that future uh, plan. So your. Uh, after having spent part of the day with you, you're in constant motion. Uh, your late seventies, perhaps eighty. Eighty, okay. I love eighty. How do you do it? What keeps what keeps you running? You're still ideas are just shooting like sparks. The time. Let me tell you, when you get to be eighty years old, some of the things that you get to inherit is going to the bathroom a lot, aches <laughs> and pain. But I found when I am working. I don't have aches and pains, and I don't have to go to the bathroom a lot. <laughs> so that's better than the pills. So that's what I do, is work. Oh, as much as I can work, I work. We'll talk about your next project. How about yourself, John? Because you and your wife were gracious to join us today, but you're passionate about the car. You continue to be a goodwill ambassador for the car. We've heard about your sons maintaining the legacy, but day to day, what are things like for you? Um, I, well, basically, it's mostly car things. Um, we have a, we have a, some land in, in, in Ann Arbor, so we're, I'm always taking care of the property, um, um, taking care of the house. It's a 30-year-old house, so there's a lot to do there. And, uh, I just enjoy life. I've been, uh, Malcolm has decided I can't use the word retired anymore. And, and I'm always, you know, I get up in the morning at 6 or 7 o'clock and I start working. And uh, I just work all day on, on my project. So it's nice to not have to go get a paycheck anymore. But um, I just enjoy, enjoy life. And, and it mostly is car stuff. I'm, I'm always being asked to do something. Can I ask you this? There's nothing wrong with with getting rich. Was was your was your grandfather's aim to build a car and get rich, or to get rich by building a car? Hmm. That's a good question. It is a good question. Um, I, I I think he enjoyed he enjoyed the lifestyle of being rich, but it was never what motivated him. He wanted to build he wanted to build a great car and and, and build something and build a build a future for his family that way. So I, I don't think. He was never motivated by money. In fact, he used to always say to people, "Oh, it's easy to get money. You need money, I'll go get you some money. That's not that's not a problem." And he did do it. He, he was always finding different new sources of money. So, uh, but then once once they started doing the government started doing what they were doing, he, he couldn't. He just couldn't keep up. So, so he he never was motivated. By money. He liked the process. Malcolm, you you have been very entrepreneurial and tried your hand at many things. Not. Uh, always successful, but you quickly moved on to something else. But often, more often than not, it has involved cars. Yeah. Yeah, for some reason, I mean, it's hard to explain, but I fell into the car business. And the truth of the matter is, I am not a car guy, but I know the car industry better than anybody in the universe, in my opinion. I know, I, for some reason, I can see where it's going forward. I can see what to do, but I can't do the things necessary to get it done but I can oversee them for sure. I know whether I want them or I don't want them, and I have learned to get really good people that feel the same, that are really knowledgeable, that love what they're doing, and that's that, that's the fun of it all. That makes it fun, because the truth of the matter is it is never where you're going to get to, it's every day what you gotta do. Right. And if you're having fun doing it, you win. Never lose. I only The only lose is when they take all my money, I don't got my mind. I ain't happy about that. But that didn't mean that all that time going there was bad. I got my money's worth. And I got lessons here that give me an opportunity. You asked the question about is it for money? Damn yes. Money is really great. Having money is really fabulous. Not having money sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, I'm 
matter is, having money is not going to get me my day full of not having pills and going to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. What's going to get me that is doing something I love, and that means anything I do, I want to love it. So I never can lose. I'm loving being here. Yeah. Right. We're, we're thrilled to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't want the evening to get away from us without questions from the audience. Could I get some questions from the audience here now? Don't be timid. I mean, you're with us. Sir. Um, I was reading the, uh, like a video on the documentary. The correct uh, two questions. One is the gold wing said that uh, what I saw was that you're watching TV with your kids one day and one of the cartoons had the gold wing and that's where you kind of got the idea. And the second question is that your father used a seven pound hammer to to see if he could delaminate the two and if they didn't delaminate then the body was good. Is yeah. that through the seven pound hammer? Okay, I'm not sure about the hammer part, but I am sure about the gold wing door part. That's accurate. There was a thing on television, now we're talking about in the uh, early 70s. And I had three boys at the time, so watching television was the best way to keep quiet. We watched a lot of television on Saturday. <laughs> and there was a show that was called 1999, A Space Odyssey, I think is what it was called. And Martin ran, Lando. Huh? No. UFO. And it was not a cartoon, it was a really, like a show on the moon. UFO. That's right, you got it. Commander and State. every, the beginning of the show, the car goes, <laughs> and the doors go, <laughs> and when I want that. And I would wait to watch the beginning of the show every day, no matter what, just that. Uh, it got me. <laughs> How difficult was it to create that doll? Like the doll? Oh, my God, that was a bitch. That, Nobody that in the company wanted that to happen. Nobody <laughs> wanted to do They went out of the way to make sure they told me they couldn't do it. <laughs> and we were down to a month before production, and I did not have, I had a door, but I didn't have a door opening or shut. And they were telling me, ah, too bad, you can't build it. And as I'm walking, I'm really pissed, and I'm not sure what to do next. And I'm walking out to get in the car to go fly back to Pennsylvania. And one of the kids, that was just one of the kids helping, came running out and said, Mr. Brickland, could I talk to you for a minute? Oh, absolutely. He said, I know how to make a gold wing door. I said, how? He said, go take the hydraulic off of the um, convertible the one that pushed the convertible up and down and put it at the B-post. And I said, really? He said, yeah, it's behind the hydraulic. It'll open the door, it'll shut the door. <laughs> Guaranteed, it. you can have the wind that goes up and down, you'll have no problem. But if they know I told you, I'm fired. <laughs> so then, let's go. We went back. Now, in those days, we had no computers. So my engine, 200 engineers are sitting drawing every single thing on there. Makes a big difference when you have computers, let me tell you guys. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, I called everybody in. I said, gentlemen, we are have a new program going on. This gentleman here told me that if you do this, this will happen. I believe he's right. I am leaving, and I will be back next week. And when I'm back next week, I'm going to push a button. The door's going to open, or we're closing the shop. It's over. I'm not building the car. If I don't have that, please help him do that, because anybody who does it is getting fired. See you later. Goodbye. And left. And I came back and it was working. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Questions on yes, sir. Strickland. Who are the workers of New Brunswick? One of the reasons the car was a failure in in certain eyes that they were not skilled workers. Yeah. It was not their fault. And yes, they were not skilled workers. And yes, I went there because we got the money to go there. And they were all good people. And in fact, I called the UAW in to unionize them because I didn't like the way my managers were abusing them, to tell you the truth. So I called the union in, and we ended up at UAW. Yes, they needed training, but it was our fault. We didn't give them the kind of training they needed. And the car had problems that had to be solved. At, like the door. It had nothing to do with good or bad labor. It had to do with, we made a mistake. I want to tell you about a mistake that was worse than that. We have acrylic body and a fiberglass that's married to it, we thought. What it is is bonded to it. And we are sending cars all over the country to test cars, up in the mountains, into hot in Phoenix, into cold, into everywhere, so we find out what's going to happen before it happens to the cars that are out there. But understand, we're under pressure. 
we got a politician out there that's telling to get the damn thing done. All right? Didn't say, here's the money to get it done. He said, go get it done. So I have to scramble to go get money other than that to make sure we can afford to do it. I get a call from Phoenix, Arizona. They were in 114 degree temperature all day long to find out the heat. Nothing melted. Everything's fine. They put it in the, the parking area, which is air conditioning parking area. And when they came out, the acrylic body had unbonded from the fiber and was sitting on the floor. Oh. How would you like that? <laughs> so I called up Roman Haas. We have a problem. I need something that bonds to both of them so that they can move because they all expand in different times because the temperature affects them each differently. And they said, oh, we're sorry. We only know about acrylic. We know nothing about fiberglass. <laughs> Great. So I called up uh, Owen Gordon. They gave me the same story. So now I got two different materials, and I need somebody to invent chemical dis whatever to make they go in there that will keep those things together under extreme heat and cold so when it goes like this, it doesn't fall apart. And I got two weeks to do it. <laughs> and they did it. New Brunswick people did it. And nobody ever came off of the car again. So we had really good people. And we attacked the problems and we went out to find the problems. But we got into a situation, in this case, not of our making. The making was we took money from the government. That was the mistake. And if I didn't take up the money from the government, we wouldn't have been in St. John, that's for sure. We wouldn't have been in Moncton. But by doing that, I put into motion, because of the notoriety, the governor, governor the prime minister, the premier, using it to win an election. And unfortunately, being called the Brooklyn election was not a smart thing to happen. I had no choice. And it wasn't me they were talking about. They were talking about the car that he blatantly used. And I don't blame him one bit. If I was, I would have done exactly the same thing. And maybe I would have closed it down too. I don't know. But that's what happened. And the problems that were so immense, that those two problems there were the biggest problems we had. And both of them got solved in a week. Sir, you might have a question for you. Um, what, how many Subarus did you sell when you were selling Subarus? Well, first of all, I understand last year they sold 700,000. Uh, we started off with the Subaru 360. That was the little car. Right. Cost me $640, FOB Yokohama. And we sold it retail for twelve ninety five. Everything was really going terrific with that. I couldn't get them in fast enough. So I had money out there on letters of credit, on ships that were coming in, on pieces that were coming into the factory that were going to build it to go on the ships that are coming in. And Consumer Report had an article, front page, front cover, Cadillac, face to face with my little 360. This, by the way, got 66 miles to the gallon. You could sit four people in it. It had white wall tires and a radio and a heater and sold for $12.95. And they said, unsafe because it did not have to meet the safety requirements. It didn't. It was under 1,000 pounds. Now, believe it or not, although it was a little car, and if it got hit by something big, it would, you would think, have a really serious problem. But it didn't. Here's what happened. When you hit a light car, it goes. It doesn't crush. It goes. All right? Now, it goes maybe in places you weren't happy to where it goes. <laughs> but the point is, it did not smash. I mean, there two cars going into it. Then that's, forget about it. You have your coffin, you just dig a hole and you stick the car in. <laughs> <laughs> but most hits are one person against one person. And in order to survive, you need a crush. If you don't have a crush, if you have a car that stands straight and you end up not injuring anything, you, something happened to you. Your lungs or your hearts or your eyes popped out at a certain speed because something has to take it. That's why we build safety into it. But with a lighter car, the car goes and that's the crush it takes. So it was not what they were saying, but everything they said was also true. We did not have to meet the safety rules. We did not have airbags in it. We did not have a lot of things in it. And that's why I could sell it for $12.95. Well, I get told about it, and I said, oh, big deal. What's the circulation of, 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 of 
Consumer Reports. Consumer Reports. Thank you. That's what my 80 is. <laughs> and uh, so they said 500,000. I said, well, screw it. So 500,000 people won't buy my car. Another lesson learned. It wasn't the 500,000 people that read it. It was all the banks that read it. And they cut off the floor planning for the dealers. I would have too. Who the hell needs that? Who needs to go finance a car that the consumer report is saying is unsafe because it didn't meet the safety regulations? And they sure as hell did not give a damn about what I had to say about it. So all of a sudden, all my dealers stopped owning my cars. And I have cars coming in, and I have cars being built, and I have letters of credit out, which means they're going to be paid for. And so my job next was figure a way to get rid of these damn things in not the normal way. And I started a thing called Fast Track where these little cars ran around and got smashed up around the clock and people paid a dollar for the thing and I got rid of a lot of cars by having them all smashed up. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got the bigger car. And the miracle of that was they didn't want to give it to us. And if they didn't give it to us, we'd be out of business. And I convinced them to give me that contract and I convinced them to give me a perpetual contract. And if that you think is a button, if you don't think that's a big deal, no company in the universe ever got a perpetual contract. And they were going crazy, and I had enough something way full or something that may let them give me what I wanted, even though they didn't want to. And that's what brought the company from their success. They brought in a front-wheel drive, and then we got into all-wheel drive, and from there on, the cars went like crazy. When I left in 74, I'm not sure what the numbers were, it was probably in the... 15, 20,000 units who were coming in. But from there, it started to grow as fast as we could bring in more models. But the people who followed me, by the way, Mike Sanyer, who I brought in from Volkswagen, Harvey Lamb, who had been my partner in the very beginning, they ran that company and they did a really great job. And I went off to build a car. <laughs> it was a whole bunch of money. Mr. Brickman, did you have much communication with John DeLorean along the way? John DeLorean. When I was getting rid of these cars in Fast Track, a gentleman who was working for me, Jack DeLorean, not John DeLorean, although John's name is Jack, by the way, Jack DeLorean, who was his brother, his younger brother, he was working with me at the Fast Track thing, and he said, oh, my God, you know, my brother, John, would love these tracks. And Pensky, Roger Pensky, his buddy, Man, they're into racing. They would love this thing. Can I tell them about this? I said, absolutely. They can have them as far as I'm concerned. I have one goal. Get rid of those cars. That's the only way I know how. Go run around the track and get paid for it and smash them. So he told John about it. And John and Roger got excited about it. We had some conversation. I had a clock that it was invented by Hewer. We went to them and asked them. And it... It, it, um, when you went around the track, it told you how fast you were going, but you could have five cars on the track at the same time, individually told them the time. And you were always going faster to try to go. You were actually going about 15 miles an hour. Because you were going around curves and dirt, and it felt like you were going really fast, but it was going slow. And you'd turn over. We had, it was a fun, it was fun. And they decided, they really liked it, but they had no Subarus they were trying to get rid of. So they designed a cool little car, a go-kart in effect, and they used the clock part of the thing, and they started a thing called the uh, Malibu Grand Prix. And uh, so that got me to have my friend John Delorean become my friend. And I admired the man. He was doing some great stuff. His problem was he had a big mouth, and he was out there, and General Motors doesn't like that. If you're not the president, they want you to be quiet. And if you're the president, they sort of want you to be quiet, too. They want everything nice and quiet, too. And he was not that kind of guy. He was handsome and he was charismatic and he was single. A couple times he was single. <laughs> <laughs> and that was not the style. And after he did Malibu Grand Prix, I get a call from him. Malcolm, when's the next time you're in Detroit? I said, well, I'm there every week. He said, I, I know you've hired a lot of my Corvette guys that are doing your engineering. Said, yeah. He said, uh, would you mind if when you come into town, I pick you up at the airport and we go, let me spend time looking? I said, he might go. Flew in, picked me up in a stretch, Debbie. And we go to my place where they're doing all the, the building of the prototypes. And he knew everybody because they worked for him at Corvette. That's the people I stole. And they sat and they had a good conversation. And he gets back in the car and he says, 
what would you think if I told you I'd be willing to quit General Motors and be your president? I said, well, first I'd kiss your ass. I'd love that. He said, um, well, you know, I'm going to need about a million six because that's how much I'm going to lose if I leave. And a million six was a lot of money to me, but if you imagine a million six today for a man like that, he probably gets a hundred million dollars or something. So I said, okay, no problem. Here's what you do. You get your attorney and you, you fly to Philadelphia. I'll make a meeting with the chairman of the board of uh, First Pennsylvania. I'll put up more Subaru stock. I'll get you a million six. It'll be like hiring a quarterback. I love it, John. I'm so excited. I needed somebody to run it. You're perfect. So John flew in with his attorney, met John Bunning, who was the chairman of the board. John Bunning was impressed out of his mind and said, yeah, I'll give you the million six, Malcolm. We shook hands and we had a deal. I go home, da, 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 da. John DeLorean's going to run this thing. Oh, I'm so happy I can't stand it. Told everybody, oh, this is really great. I get a call from John. Malcolm, I've been thinking. I think I need the million six after taxes. I'm thinking for a minute. I said, John, that's not a problem. But you know what I think the problem is going to be? I think the next thing you're going to come back with is you want your name on the back of the car. We're going to have a problem. I want my name on the back of the car. So how about if we don't do this deal? And I called it off. Now fast forward. I failed. It was a lot of publicity. I get a call from John. Malcolm, next time you're in Detroit, can we have dinner? Absolutely, John. He said, I'm building the car, he said. Okay, cool. Well, you got any suggestions? I said, yep. I said, one, if you don't do something fancy with the door, you might as well not build your car. But you're going to have problems with the door if you do go wing, and here's some of the problems. He said, okay, well, I've worked with go wing, and I know some of the things. I don't, I'm not going to have problems. Okay. <laughs> I said, next thing, warn you. Do not put it in a paint facility. Do something, but don't do acrylic. Do something that doesn't need painting. So you save that money, number one, and that's going to be a bottleneck. He like said, I know that. You're 100% true. We're going to do it that way, too. I said, the last thing is, you know all those guys you saw that used to work for you? Hire them. Because they know what the hell to do, and they're good people, and they'll be you're able to get you off running really fast. He said, I'm going to do that. Great, thank you. You got to listen. I said, I'll send them to you. And that was it, except for one more thing. I said, the way you do it, you're going to need a lot of money because you're going to do it big time way. You're going to need a couple hundred million. The Irish government has called me and asked me to build a plant in Ireland. Now, they were killing people there at the time. And they said they'd give me all the money. And I said, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I just don't want to do that. Go ahead, John. Go be my guest. They'll give you everything. You, they'll give everything you ever wanted in life. Understand something. By doing what I did, that's what caused my downfall. If you know what you're doing, know that that's going to be your Achilles heel, but they're going to give you the money and you're going to need a lot of it. He went out and he did. And he spent $300 million. And it took me two years from beginning to end, and it took him eight years from beginning to end. And I got a call one day from one of the guys working for him that used to work for me, he said, you're not going to believe what's happening. John just took $13 million and going to Switzerland to open an account, and he's telling everybody. I said, oh, my God, you must have read some kind of book about wheeler dealers, and he thinks that's one way to do it. Anyhow, that came up when all the aggravation happened for him, and they didn't do anything about it, and he got to keep the $13 million. God bless him. <laughs> but I tell you one more thing. When he got involved, and I walked in, I was in Florida at the time, and I walked in, I turned the television, and I saw John Lawyer with his hands behind him, and I fell to the floor, and I put my hands up. I'm not religious. I put my hands up. I said, thank you, God, for only making me go bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was, I was religious in that moment, let me tell you. Question over here. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Tucker, yeah. uh, how many of the, of the Tuckers have you personally seen, or how many have you personally driven? Uh, 41 I've seen. I'm not sure how many I've driven, probably half of that. Um, there's a, one one couple in uh, um, England that had just saw their 42nd, so they're one ahead of me, which aggravates me a little bit. We try to go on with them, because um, it was one I hadn't seen before. But uh, they're people I've known. Uh, they're, there's a huge Tucker fan base. People just love the Tuckers. And, uh, they all, that's one of the competitions they all have. And, uh, by the way, the uh, 
day I met this fellow back in 1991, it was at a show, it was at an um, auction in, in Michigan at Domino's Farms, and I met Greg Harris. Greg, could you stand up? Say hello. Greg is one of my oldest friends. He's also the inventor of the modern hockey mask, by the way. Um, great guy. I met those two gentlemen at the same time. They were both dressed in 40s outfits. They were both big Tucker fans. Greg's a big Tucker fan still, and he lives right in Toronto, so he, he came down for the, for the show today. I really appreciate that. Um, but uh, and we've, we have, we've just found out recently that Brent and his father were also at that show back in 1991. So it's uh, kind of full circle. Did, did uh, Tucker, um, the center light, the sidewalk light, or right. it's called, mm -hmm. did it move when the car turned? Or? Yeah, it was, it was attached with uh, cables and uh, it was two, done two different ways, but basically, when you turn the steering wheel more than 15 degrees, it would the light would turn on. When it was going straight, it didn't. It didn't. It wasn't on. And that was just sort of a regulation that the government came up with somewhere that they thought that the, it looked like three motorcycles were coming at you, so they didn't want three headlights going all the time. I don't quite get that, but, but uh, so that was the original. That was the original concept. And, uh, and we that built was a, one of the first cars that did. Like you would, as you turned, it would light the way. Right, right, yeah. Right? But but there were some accessory items you could buy before that, and they even in back to cars in the twenties and thirties that that you could you they connect cables to the to the middle, and then so that idea was sort of out there, there, but not really used very much. Okay. So incorporated in, into a whole car. So, that was probably the most prominent feature of it. Of course. Yeah, that's that's pretty much how that happened. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure we have time for a few more questions, sir. One more, please. Just very quick. Did any other governments in Canada offer you the chance? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Did any other governments of Canada offer you any other provinces the opportunity to win the business in their province? Was it strictly the any other provinces? Oh, oh, oh. For to go into um, first, we went to the Renault factory. It was in Montreal. To look at it. And then I found they were unionized, and I also talked to the people that was running the factory, and they said that was going to be a serious problem. So I walked away from that situation. They didn't offer me anything. I didn't ask for anything from them. And then a, somebody that was a friend of mine said, you ought to go to New Brunswick. they got a free meal there that's pretty damn aggressive, and they could use the drops. And so, no, that was it. I didn't go anywhere else. I, I'm telling you something. I always thinking back. I was really, really taken with the premier of New Brunswick. I thought the man was as good as could be. I thought he was a great a great politician, great human being, and I thought he was really good for the province. I wasn't happy with what he did to me. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, sir. Mr. Berkland, how are you making out with your uh, three wheel electric uh, uh -huh. car? Let me tell you, I couldn't be happier. Could not be happier. Because I have this somehow ability to look at the industry and think and see what's going to come out. About 10 years ago, and I've always played with electric, but the batteries have always never been up to it. In fact, in the 90s, I met a man by the name of Dr. Malcolm Curry, who used to be under Secretary of Defense for Technology and was had just retired as chairman of Fuse Aircraft. And uh, he had, oh, his team also built the EV-1 for General Motors. He was really pissed that they pulled them all back in. in right. <laughs> really pissed. So he and I got together and we were trying to figure out what, how to get the next, the next step in electric with the batteries that exist. And we came to the conclusion after building a whole bunch of prototypes, this was not going to work. You couldn't get the distance to make anybody. I, I was uncomfortable. I couldn't tell it. <coughs> but we decided, why don't we put them in the bicycle? So we did, and we created a bicycle called the EV Warrior, and it was actually designed, the design of the bicycle was Design Works in California, and they were half owned by BMW, now they're 100% owned by BMW. Yeah, we won all sorts of wonderful awards, and we actually started the electric bike industry in the United States. Um, and we sold it, by the way, to car dealers, and they loved it because they got the publicity that they were selling a clean vehicle from a lousy little bicycle. It was one little problem. People would come in and say, I heard about that EV work, can I see it? Nobody wanted to talk to them 
because nobody wanted to throw away their up. That up, if they sold it, they made 50 bucks, they go to the back of the line. So bicycle, it's over there. Which was okay, because people got on the bike and they loved it. End of story. What's the next problem? The next problem, the people who are riding and buying the bicycle are not bicycle riders. So we had mirrors and we had flashing turn signals in the mirrors and we had all the lights. I mean, it was the safest bicycle that you could build. Except the people who were riding it on the road going, oh my God, look at these cars that I got. And they don't know what they're doing. So they ended up not riding on the, on the road, which was a really smart thing, which limited where they were going. And back in the 90s, they did not have a lot of bicycle paths. So it was a cool thing that everybody liked, but there was nowhere to go. And they ended up in the, you ride in your garage and you showed everybody about it. And I realized this was not a business for me. And Dr. Curry said, you know what? Let's remodel what we got and sell it to people like uh, Walmarts and stuff like that. I said, not for me. And he ended up doing that and was very successful. So the recent one, Lee Ayako Kabat, ah. which I've when been I just, When we Lee decided, he just, when Dr. Curry decided he wanted to do something different, wanted to do a hub motor, which made a lot of sense, but he wanted to sell the parts to people like Walmart to let them do their own thing. So we were going to get out of the EV Warrior business and one of the people working for me, I assigned to Lee, because Lee was retiring. He came to see me. He said, what do you think? I said, I love it. It's a great business. It's a lot of fun. I'm not interested anymore. If you want to go do it, go do it. Dr. Curry is going to go off and do it this way. And he said, yeah, you know what? I like the idea. Spent about two months together every day. And he hired one of our guys, and he took all his assignments, went to the people that we, the bicycle company that we met, which we gave him. I mean, it was a very nice, and he went out, <laughs> and he realized, oh my God, well, who's going to sell them? Everybody wants to buy them, but who's going to sell them? Car dealers are not really the right thing, because their salesmen don't want to go up for $50. The car the thing was selling for twelve ninety five. by the way. So he, smarter than all of us, found a loophole in the law that said you get X amount of rebate if you have a two or three wheel vehicle electric. And he starts buying golf carts and giving them to people. And somehow he got more money than the golf carts cost. So he sold a lot of golf carts, electric golf carts to a lot of people. He gave a lot of golf carts to a lot of people and got whatever the credits were that you got for that. Then he sold them all. And he, as I said, he was smart at all of it. And he did that for a while. Ladies and gentlemen, before our evening comes to an end, I was wondering if I could ask uh, each of our guests, is there anything we haven't touched on, uh, a story that you're, John, you're dying to tell us, something that's the uh, <coughs> unvarnished truth from the Tucker <laughs> Archives? <laughs> from the Tucker Archives. Um, I can't really think of uh, something like that. I, can, I guess I was going more toward the, uh, the interest that's, that's kept up all these 70 years and then the fan base and the... Uh, out of 51 cars, 47 are still running, um, and, and it's, it's, it's gratifying to me to be spending my retirement coming to places like this and, and talking about it, and people are still listening, so I think my grandfather would have been really pleased to, to know that, and uh, for me, that's, that's, that's the best part of my retirement. I don't call it a retirement, sorry, no. Thank you, sir. But my, uh, my, my new endeavor, I suppose, yeah. I have to be a little bit of an entrepreneur now, so. but I'm not an entrepreneur. But you are, but that's okay. Enjoy my uh, children and, and family. So. But that's really, um, Preston, pretty much everything's out there that he did. Um, there's, there's a lot of little tidbits, but uh, he was just intent to build the car. And, and, uh, it's a, you know, a good businessman, but uh, and Malcolm, if Malcolm would have run our company, we'd have been still here today. No. <laughs> if Malcolm run the company, would not be here today. <laughs> But if I had something to do with it, and we could get somebody really cool that knew what he was doing, then we'd be here. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, Malcolm doesn't know how to run a company. Malcolm doesn't want to run a company. Oh, no. then, yeah, well. It's a kind of different kind of thing that is not what my talents are. Right. Right. I have nothing really to say except the, except the following. I found that there, are, when you do something and it doesn't work out the way you want it, there's a tremendous amount of naysayers. Oh, yeah. that are out there. Somebody made a film because somebody who worked for the Brooklyn 
got laid off, but everybody got laid off. But he loved his job so much that it ruined his life. He couldn't get past it. And this son of his got to see his father deteriorate, not being able to go to the next place and sitting around and hating everything about the person. And he made a film. So he was going to show me, show the world what an asshole I was. And he made a film. And in that film, he had his father. And his father said the following thing that really opened my eyes to how crazy this world is. He said, you know, I bought a gun and I had it in the top drawer in my office in St. John. And when Mr. Brooklyn came, I was going to kill him. But then he came and he told us where it was going to happen. And I got so excited again, I hugged him. Uh, <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something. That's scary. <laughs> between, a, between killing me and hugging me, I'm not sure exactly which is not. But a lot of people get really down on things. And like what's happening right here? Look at this great place. And Brett is fighting the city instead of the city kissing him and encouraging him to do that. That is the things that drive me crazy. I don't want to get a gun, but uh, maybe. But <laughs> it really is so bad that people don't get behind people when they have something that could be good if it works. Help them make it work. Don't sit there and say, well, let's see if it works. Well, go help them. Help them means you're going to have something good. When he talks about he's not, he's an entrepreneur. Anybody who does anything is an entrepreneur. All it is is doing something and creating something. It's great. What is great? Goddamn car. Who needs it? If it was still being built today, so what? I mean, all due respect, it's something that I have to like to do, and I'm going to keep doing it because I like to do it. And everybody out here has things you'd like to do. All I'm saying to you, go do it. I've been 80 years old, and I wouldn't change one damn day of my life. Now, I'm very young. And I'm telling you, I love being here with you guys. When my wife heard that we were invited to come here, she was excited. And it's very little that gets her excited about going anywhere. <laughs> I am really happy to be here, guys. You are really all special. I think this has stimulated some more questions. Go ahead. Uh, one last one, maybe, uh, for Malcolm. And what, I'm sorry, what's that? Yes. Oh, I'd be happy to. Thank you for asking. <laughs> <laughs> so I sat around and I listened to everybody talk about electric. And they talk about what's important is to save the pounds off the car. Well, the more you save off the car, the less batteries you have to have. The batteries are the most expensive. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay. Well, I said, I certainly can't build an SUV. Everybody's going to build an SUV, and they're all getting in really serious right now. You're going to see electric cars like you never saw before in your life. Problem is, well, we won't worry about the problems of recharging and all those cute little things, but everybody's going to build an SUV. Oh, how about a pickup truck? Everybody's going to build a pickup truck. How about a sedan? Everybody's going to build a sedan. Well, what the hell do they need me to build a better what? But I remember when I worked with three wheel, three wheel vehicles, taking one wheel off saves 1,500 pounds. That means I don't have to put 30 kilowatts extra into the car, and I can sell a car that could sell for $150,000 because it looks like it, because it drives like it, because it feels like it, and I can sell that for $25,980. And when I showed it, to a couple thousand people and said, here's what the car looks like, here's what the specs are, built by, I mean, designed by race car engineers so you can survive at 100 miles an hour. What do you think it costs? The average guess was 113000 When we told them $25,980, sold from dealers, not over the internet, from real car dealers who could service the vehicle, I got, I want one, no, I want two. And not bullshit, but they're, where do I put out the money? And we realized we had hit a place that nobody is going to go to because nobody goes from something terrific at a low price. They go low price vanilla and get better as the price goes up. We're doing it, boom. That's all we're building is that car. We're not building SUVs. We're not building, we're, but every month we're changing the exterior of the body. 
because today they have 3D printed. And what usually took eight months to go from here to here takes about four days to have them off the uh, printed equipment. 3D printing is what they call it. Yes, sir. You want a bricklet? <laughs> Do you own a bricklet? All the cars I bricklets I owned, I, I sent to museums. But if you would do me a favor and stand up and show everybody your sweatshirt, which I think is one of the best shirt, sweatshirts for Brooklyn Amazon, I would appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to make them, I'll introduce you to my son. He'll advertise it for you in the Brooklyn. Two final questions. Yes, Stan. Oh, well, John, you just mentioned about uh, uh, 47 out of 51 are still running. Are the, the remaining four out there still, or are they just long gone? Well, they were destroyed in all in different ways, but uh, the parts of all those cars, we know where pretty much every part of every car is, so, um, except for very few. But uh, um, like I said, there's one body that we're still trying to track down. But um, and those those parts have gone into restoring other cars, and you know, so there's really no attrition. The, the cars just sort of live on. Last question. John, is it true that uh, Preston was fired from the police department at one time because he, he cut a hole in the firewall of the police cruiser to get more heat in the cab? That is true. Um, but actually, that was sort of a conspiracy between my, his mother and the police department. Because she did not want him on the police department. She thought it was really unsafe. But uh, actually, even up to when Preston died, he was still officially a, a, a Lincoln Park policeman. So he, he loved that job. He loved he, when prohibition was going on, and he loved driving cars and motorcycles. So um, he could you could track him down with his motorcycle. How do you get him to the to the police station? You pull half the plugs with the plug wires, and they can't go very fast. So they have to follow you back. So, but the, those were his great days. And then, uh, but he he was dreaming. Uh, that's all. That was when he was only about. Well, he was seventeen when he when he joined the police force. So he, he did illegally. But no, he, he kept going back. Every time he'd go back to Lincoln Park, he, he went back to the police force. And so he just loved it. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for John Tucker. And Malcolm Rick. Thank you, gentlemen, for your responses. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to speak for our guests, but they may be in a position to linger for a few moments and have a private conversation with you. And again, I, I uh, regret the, curtailing the conversation, but I think we covered a lot of ground. And uh, with respect to our guests who've had a long day already and have been very generous with their time, I thank you for coming out to this terrific evening in Chatham, Rickland, and Tucker, a night with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.